Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us uh, for today's Art at Noon talk on Art for Environmental Action with Dr. Laura Perovich, Assistant Professor at Northeastern University. I'm Corey Fry, the Exhibition Manager here at the Della Plain Art Center. I do want to take just a second to let you know that we are open for business and our business hours are Monday through Saturday, 9 to 5. Sunday 11 to 5. So please come out, check out our exhibitions and things going on at the Della Plain. Um, but without further ado, today we'll be discussing the research of Dr. Lara Perovich uh, into art that inspires environmental action. Lara Perovich's research focuses on ways to create physical, contextual, and interactive experiences around data that can help people understand and act on big social cha challenges. Her data physicalizations are informed by research in information visualization and humor, human computer interaction, and often address environmental issues such as air pollution and water pollution. She's also influenced by work in experience design and environmental art, and her projects seek to create emotionally resonant knowledge producing and community building experiences with data and with people. Dr. Laura Perovich received her PhD from MIT in uh, 2020. Dr. Perovich, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. It's great. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Really looking forward to it. Um, I'm going to hop out of your way and just let you get going. So thanks again for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here with all of you today um, and to talk about environmental art in the context of civic change. Um, first, I'll give you just talk a little bit about my background. Um, as Corey mentioned, I'm a faculty member in art and design uh, at Northeastern University. Um, but before coming to Northeastern, I had a really interdisciplinary background. Um, so I do work in art and design, um, but I also, my PhD work crossed into computer science and data visualization and I've been a researcher in environmental health and in community-based research. Um, so I'm bringing a lot of different spaces together. On the artistic side, uh, my practice includes uh, textiles for data visualization, which you can see on the left here, uh, field work around uh, water quality issues in uh, salt marshes, um, and also movement practices for interacting with information. Uh, so you can see these spaces are, are all pretty different and it's um, some examples of the wide range of perspectives I bring to this work. Uh, so my talk today is loosely based around my uh, 2018 paper that looked at environmental art from the perspective of civic action. Um, so if you're interested in this, I definitely uh, recommend checking out the paper, which has a lot more examples and some more uh, details and analysis of the projects I'll talk about today. Uh, so in the talk today, I'm gonna start by describing the space of environmental art and civic change. Uh, I'll then give a few example applications um, of the space, talk a bit about one of my own installations, and talk through some of the challenges to efforts in this area. Uh, so first, this idea of environmental art and civic change. Uh, to start off, I want to note that um, my treatment of environmental art is not in any way exhaustive. Um, and that this is really expansive and highly varied space. Um, and I'm less inter interested in the precise definition, but more about how we can explore this space um, to understand potential for civic change. Um, more broadly, environmental art has ties to eco art, to land art, speculative design, um, public art, eco-feminist art, art, and many, many other fields. Um, I've included a few examples of some of the uh, more famous artists who sort of sit near and in these spaces uh, on this slide, uh, but I also want to emphasize that there are really many, many others out there who take uh, a whole range of different perspectives um, to this space. Uh, so when I'm approaching this space, I'm going to take this really broad definition um, and think about environmental art as art that engages with or centers on environmental issues. Um, again, this is a pretty uh, inclusive definition. Um, but I do see it as an opportunity to explore this general space and see how it might interact with ideas of civic action. Uh, so to get us started in thinking about environmental art for civic change, I wanted to share an example 
Uh, so this is a picture of the Ice Wash project, um, and this is particular installation occurred in Paris. Um, it's a pretty famous project, so you may have seen it before. Um, but um, basically what happened here is Oliver Ellison, who's the artist, and Mingyu Rossing um, took ice from glaciers and brought it into the public sphere um, at times where there was some big climate event happening. Uh, so this is, I believe, during the Paris Accord um, negotiations. Uh, so it's a public art installation that can be seen as a statement and also a form of protest uh, and creates this point of gathering and conversation in the community. It's also really uh, attractive um, image-wise, so it can attract media attention to some of these issues in the way that perhaps the negotiation or the debates can't. Um, and it's a one, one uh, really well-known example around of environmental art that's aiming to create civic change. Um, I'll note that here in this particular installation, the civic change was uh, fairly central. So it was very intentional and that was one of the main uh, purposes of the project. But there are also environmental art pieces where civic change is sort of a secondary piece. So when we're thinking about this space of civic change, uh, first we need to look at uh, research on creating change. Uh, and there's really a lot of different fields that work in this area. This includes things like behavioral science, uh, psychology, economics, civic technology, among many, many others. Um, there are many important findings here, but I'm gonna start from uh, two core um, areas of research that can speak to some of this work in particular. Um, so first, this idea of civic imagination, which was introduced by Henry Jenkins. Uh, and the idea here is that in order to create change, we need to be able to imagine it we need to be able to believe that it's possible. We need to think um, of ourselves as agents of change and we need to have empathy for others. And this really hits on a number of points that I think art um, is good at interacting with and good at promoting. And many of the projects I'm gonna discuss here today have at least some of these components. So this is a great lens for us to consider as we're thinking about how environmental art might create change in the world. A second theoretical model that can help us uh, was proposed by Ethan Zuckerman, and this describes four models of interaction, intervention uh, in civic problems, passing laws, influencing norms, leveraging markets, and coding. So I'll step through each of these now. So the first one is passing laws, uh, and we all know there's a long history of action here. Um, at the same time, uh, I think most people will, re will recognize that this is a slow process and that can be quite complicated. It's also something that can be undone quickly uh, with changes in power and government at, in certain circumstances. A second mode of change is leveraging markets. Uh, example here would be uh, boycotts of different products. Um, this can, per can, can exert a different sort of pressure that can be more diffuse than perhaps uh, some governmental pressures. Um, but at the same time, it does have this weakness of perhaps needing to rely on laws to last longer term instead of just being a short term uh, event. Uh, it also is somewhat limited in its impact because um, in these market spaces, profit comes first uh, and the shareholders are, are really central. The third approach is influencing norms. Um, an example here is how uh, what is represented in popular media and how it's represented. Uh, this can be a really powerful way to create change. At the same time, it can be a really slow and ambiguous process. Um, and in this particular environment, attention scarcity and uh, getting media to circulate is a real, real challenge. Uh, the final um, mode of intervening in this model is coding. Um, this can be an exciting space because it can bring new tools and actors onto the scene. So an example here would be how you know, Zoom and Skype has really changed our ability to um, function in this pandemic. Uh, at the same time, the challenges, there are big challenges here around who can access this sort of intervention. So it takes considerable tech skills in order to build the next Zoom or Skype or uh, whatever else. Uh, and the ambivalence of tech. So um, we've obviously seen that many of these tools uh, can act in some good ways, but also some really destructive ways as well. So with those frameworks in mind, um, I'm gonna talk through a few examples in environmental art now uh, that'll hopefully help, um, under, help everyone understand those spaces in a richer way. 
So the first project is Air Inc. Um, that's out of Gravity Labs. Uh, so here they created devices that can collect pollution from motorcycles and cars, and also created a process that turns um, this smog into ink that can then be used in a variety of artistic or um, commercial purposes. They've also recently added some other products, so I believe they're turning some of the smog into various plastics or cement or other form factors as well. Uh, so this is a great example of thinking about the market as a space to intervene and to create change. Um, so here you're um, gathering pollution and using it for art and also to create this project. Um, this is an example of some of the art that they created with this, um, with their air ink. Um, they've also made shirts and other screen printed items as well. Uh, and they, in their framing, they think of this work as an opportunity to uh, do upcycling of air pollution. Uh, so introducing that into the environmental framework um, and also as a way to help companies with their carbon, carbon negative journey. Uh, so again, thinking of this as something that can impact the market space and something that can uh, incentivize companies to um, think about their impact differently. I'll note too that there is this uh, secondary impact on norms at play here as well. Um, so you can see um, in their branding and in their design, there's a lot of work to like make it cool, make it exciting. Um, and this is something that art can often bring to these market spaces of this just extra sort of uh, shine to add on to any financial um, aspects. This second project really leans into the idea of norms. Uh, so this project is Not a Cornfield by Lauren Baum. Um, and in this project, they turned 32 acres of brownfield in Los Angeles into a cornfield uh, for a short amount of time where they held various events. Uh, so on the environmental side, this was able to attract herons, hummingbirds, butterflies uh, back to this urban environment. And also it created the social space for community for, through the activities. In this process, it helped people to question what belongs in the middle of this, the city. You know, is cities just for buildings or what is it like if you have this cornfield, if you have this farm, this public space there? Um, it was also particularly powerful because this was tied into um, some local history. So um, the Brownfield region at one point, I think had been a cornfield in the past or was to that space was referred to as a cornfield um, in some way. So it really resonated with local residents. Um, so this is a great strong example, I think of trying to challenge and change norms and ties into this idea of civic imagination that um, Henry Jenkins um, developed that we discussed earlier. Um, so it presents this opportunity to live in this different reality and therefore to imagine a different possibility for this space. Uh, drifting into the laws and norms side, um, as Maine goes, is a great uh, photo installation by John McKee that acts in this area. Um, so it tries to influence, it uses art to influence law and policy. And this occurred in the really early part of the environmental movement. It was an exhibit at uh, Bowdoin College in 1966 where um, he put color photographs of Maine's natural beauty side by side with black and white photographs of uh, roadside trash in Maine and other industrial uh, waste. Uh, so really drawing out this contrast of what the space could be and also um, what it was now at its worst. Uh, this exhibit was seen to be very politically impactful locally. Um, and it occurred as main state policy was being shaped around environmental issues. In fact, the same artist was hired to create a second series of photos uh, around the northern woods of Maine that were included um, in a report that led to the creation of Maine's Land Use Regulation Commission. Uh, so this, these visual representations did have an important impact in the legal space, um, as well as shifting norms around how people saw their own environment and saw pollution and trash. Uh, so these photographs made it visible in a way that uh, perhaps wasn't there before. Um, this also was a moment of imagination for what Maine could be. So it was start, the start of um, lawyers and um, policymakers in Maine thinking of it as a tourist destination, uh, which brings in this market component of um, motivation and possibility of intervention. So the final path to action um, described by Zuckerman is coding. And the Faro Robotics Dog project, project is a great example here 
that pair citizen science and art. Uh, so this piece is by Natalie Jaramajenko, who's wonderful at crossing between um, all of these spaces and especially uh, working in this coding space. Uh, so in this project, um, they took toy robots, just off the shelf things from Toys R Us, um, and added air pollution sensors and reprogrammed them to walk in the direction of the, uh, the, the most pollution. So the dog would be in place and sort of sniff around and then find what direction had the most pollution and continue in that way um, to navigate the space. So in theory, you could end up with a whole pack of dogs uh, gathering around a pollution source. Um, so this is a great example of a new sensing system that reimagines re access uh, to information. So it lets people be able to create their own pollution data that's particular to them. Uh, this piece um, functioned as a public art installation and this community event that was highly participatory. It's an opportunity for people to view data together and in context. So this isn't about um, collecting data and then going home and creating a graph. This data uh, was displayed in the space itself through the direction that the dog was walking. Um, so it's interactive, it's fun, it's very locally relevant. And it's a great example of how new tools can change um, what we know and how we know it. Um, this project is also really mediagenic. Uh, you know, it's, it's very fun, it attracts a lot of attention and press, um, which again provides another opportunity to create change and create visibility visibility for these sorts of issues. Um, so next, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of my research projects um, to show how these kind of issues have played out in my own research and practice. Um, and while I lean on some of the, the approaches and ideas discussed earlier, a lot of my work does start from this community focus. Um, so this is the opportunity to understand how that approach may or may not align with some of the civic theories I mentioned earlier. So the project I'll discuss today is Artboat. Um, so Artboat is a tool for collaborative light painting to connect communities uh, and contribute to local advocacy efforts through play and blue-green spaces using color-changing remote control boats. So this work was inspired by conversations I was having with communities in the Boston area. Um, in many of these instances, uh, the communities were really active in local parks or green spaces or environmental issues. And they have observed that um, for them, the things that were most impactful were getting people into parks because that um, helped them get more funding and helped them get, get government support for their work on green spaces. Um, and second, anything that could build civic capacity by creating communities. So bring, bringing people together and getting them invested in their spaces was really important to them in meeting their aims. Uh, so ARPO tries to contribute to these goals, um, which is a different sort of lens and a different prioritization than what you see in some of the other considerations around laws, norms, markets, and coding. Um, so I'll show you a quick video of the installation just so you can get an idea, and then I'll unpack uh, some of the systems behind the project. Great, so as you saw in the video, um, the system includes a remote control boat uh, with LEDs on it and a radio that can receive data from the shore. Um, so this is a picture of the boat. Um, and then on the shore, you have this um, color mixing board that I designed and built. Uh, so it combines the red, green, and blue color channels using sliders and lets you save the colors to a palette using these tactile buttons. So you can press the different buttons on the palette and that changes the colors on the boat will change to match the color of the button that you press. Uh, so I did uh, two installations with our boat, uh, one at Magazine Beach in Cambridge and a second at Herder Park in Alston. Um, and I also interviewed people about their experience after the event 
um, and also discussed um, some environmental and community related themes with them as well during those conversations. So one thing we saw in this work was that it really a wide range of people were attracted to this event and everyone was able to use the boats and to teach each other um, how to use these, um, these playful objects. Um, so this is really um, helpful on two levels. First of all, it tells us that the, the tech I made is, is usable, which is great. Uh, but second and more importantly, it shows it has its potential for starting conversations and creating connections um, in communities as they teach each other and as they explore these tools together. The second thing that was really exciting to see um, was that people were able to innovate with Artboat. Um, so they came up with new ways to use this and new, new um, approaches. Uh, so the picture here is an example of some of the long exposure photography that um, folks at the event were able to take. Um, so basically here you're having the shutter of the camera open for a long period of time. So you're capturing the path of the boat and the, all the light changes uh, that occur over that path. Um, this particular image came from an idea that one of the groups um, developed called Rave Boat. Uh, so basically they would just try and change the colors as fast as they possibly could. And that creates this really beautiful um, sort of speckled or fast changing pattern um, as the boat drives through the water. That was something that I, I had not even thought of. And also like on the tech side would have been extremely nervous about them trying to do since it really pushed it to the extreme. Uh, but it worked great and they were so excited about it. So that was uh, really wonderful and just shows um, the innovation that the group uh, had together. Um, aligning with the community partner goals, this installation we saw was able to start conversations between community members. Um, so folks that didn't know each other had this opportunity to start to connect and start to build community that perhaps can be um, the early seeds of something larger and, and more civic engagement. Folks also noted that the event was created an opportunity to reflect on the environment. Um, in particular here, folks noticed that um, when one time when the boat got stuck, it was because of a piece of plastic that had come from the water and that was uh, really powerful to them and really showed them uh, what was happening in their local water bodies. One participant in particular discussed how photography uh, could be a way to reflect on the community and uh, some environmental components, um, which I think is is very powerful. And also I love here how um, they surface the emotional aspect of this process. Um, so it's not only an intellectual thing, it's something that's impacting folks on a personal level and how they feel about uh, their space and the spaces that they live in. The interviews also surface larger community challenges around things like how we build our cities, how we interact with the environment, um, issues of gentrification and access to spaces, and who is included or excluded in these decision-making processes. Um, again, there's no real solutions here that we came about through this event, but it's really important that I was able to create spaces for these complicated questions to surface, for these communities to start to form, um, and to plant the seeds of engagement and um, local investment in environmental issues. Um, so I hope this is an interesting and rich set of examples uh, to start from and um, a way to begin to think about how uh, these projects, environmental art projects might act in the world, um, what kind of impact they might have in different settings and how we start to um, consider their impact as we um, move forward as artists, as researchers um, and uh, as community members. Um, I did want to close by discussing some challenges in this space uh, and just the uncertainty that's out, out there around the effectiveness, effectiveness of some of these approaches. Uh, so first, I wanted to recognize that many people have noted the difficulty of measuring these impacts, impacts of environmental art projects. Um, so the question is always, how do you know if it works? What, what sort of thing can you expect to see? Uh, this question becomes particularly pressing uh, when you're considering projects that have significant environmental costs or financial costs, because then there's even more 
um, need to to show that this is making a difference, that you're doing something that's um, significant and an impacting environmental um, progress. Uh, the Ice Watch project in particular is one that's really cited for this and has been criticized through these lenses um, because you know shipping glacier ice from a glacier to Paris or Copenhagen or wherever else, you know, it isn't cheap. Um, it's fairly environmentally costly because you have it on this you know huge boat that's going through the ocean a long distance. Um, so you know, the question is always, is is that enough? Is the um, the extent to which it was able to impact the talks worth the trade-off of the financial or environmental costs. And I think you know, there's no, no clear answer to that question. I think a second aspect that's really important to note here um, is just how many forces are out there that act against environmental artwork um, and that are at play in these environmental questions and environmental systems. Uh, so this can be things like economic power, you know, money behind oil, for, for example, uh, governmental power, both um, locally, nationally, and internationally. Um, that's certainly something that um, some people benefit from keeping the system, system as is, um, as well as another, a number of other longer term uh, systems that are really difficult to change. Um, Merchants of Doubt is the great book that starts to describe some of these spaces in a really um, clear and meaningful way. Uh, and I think for us can raise this question of, is it reasonable for us to expect that environmental art can effectively act against all these forces? Um, again, no, no clear answer there, but an important thing to, to keep in mind um, and perhaps to think about, is there a way for environmental artwork to um, really align itself with one of these forces and try to um, uh, take it on more directly as opposed to thinking more um, in the environmental space. So can you look at economic power in relation to environmental issues and do uh, create artwork that addresses those systems as a way to address the larger problem? Uh, finally, uh, this book, Climate Change as a Social Drama, has a wonderful example on uh, climate change art um, and the possibility that it is a failure. Um, so I would for sure recommend this. Um, it looks in more detail at whether all these spaces are successful or not. Uh, so it's trying to do some of the analysis on things um, like the um, Ice Watch in Paris, trying to break that down and think about, okay, can we, you know, perhaps not calculated, but start to have an estimate of whether this was worth the trade-offs or not. Um, broadly, they, know, they notice a number of shortcomings in the outcomes of environmental art projects. Um, first, they note that environmental art has uh, somewhat limited respect in the art world. It hasn't uh, broken in with the prestige as a lot of other um, more traditional forms of art has. Um, and that's a, a real challenge in terms of um, accessing power and potentially creating change. They also note that uh, the other side has been similarly weak. Um, so engaging uh, communities with environmental art has also been difficult. It's sort of been this weird in between where it's uh, perhaps um, not elite enough to be sort of elite and not for the people enough to uh, feel really accessible to broad communities. Um, which I think as, as practitioners in the space is really something that's important to consider and is something that I've been thinking about um, as I create some of my work in projects like our boat. Um, so I definitely recommend uh, this book if you're interested in these questions and interested in thinking about these problems more. Uh, so I've surfaced a number of challenges here and also a number of environmental art projects. Um, so I just wanted to step back for a second and think about like, what do, where does this leave us? And I think this is gonna really depend on the per person, but for me in particular, I think of environmental art as one tool in the toolkit. Um, so it gives, it gives some possibilities. It has some, um, it can be really powerful in some ways, I think, especially around changing norms. It can really resonate with folks in that manner. Um, at the same time, there are a lot of difficulties, um, so we do need to proceed with caution. Um, many have suggested that environmental art could learn from some more successful campaigns in art um, for creating change, 
Uh, so HIV AIDS is one of the main examples that surfaced here as an area where art was really powerful in shifting the narrative and shifting um, actions in communities. I think it's a great prompt too for artists to consider any environmental harms that surface in their process. Um, so, you know, thinking about the materials that you're using, uh, how they're sourced, um, and considering if there's ways to um, make any of those impacts left less. Perhaps in some cases there aren't, but um, there may be moments where it's easy to make a positive impact um, by reusing materials or something like that. Uh, finally, uh, for me, I think it's really important to consider artistic approaches to environmental issues um, in explicit partnerships with other efforts. So perhaps this is working directly with communities who have a lot of local knowledge about what can create positive change. Uh, perhaps it's um, working with sociologists or researchers who look at some of these big um, challenges around power structures and environmental issues and trying to um, take on some of those problems together. Um, I think most important is just to consider environmental art as part of a larger network that can hopefully lead towards um, some kind of impact and change on these really difficult and challenging problems. Uh, so thanks so much. Um, it's been great to talk with you today and I'm happy now to take any questions or um, talk through some of these projects a bit more. Oh, thank you so much. It's that is, um, it's all really fascinating. My mind is going in a whole lot of different directions here. Um, I didn't see any questions come through or chat or anything, but I had a few that I thought I'd bring up. I mean, the, one of the really interesting things here for me is that, like on a, on a personal level, just to be honest about it, a lot of environmental issues seem seem so large that there's so little that I can do about it to see an effective change um, over time or anything like that. And so it feels such, it feels like it's at such a distance. And the thing that I love about environmental artwork is that it, it brings it into, it brings it into my direct purview where, where I'm, I'm paying attention to something that is shifting in time in a lot of cases um, and is brought even to an aesthetic level that at least affects my imagination, like the one of the, the points of from Henry Jenkins about just being able to imagine again. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about sort of how it brings how it brings these really large problems into more of an immediacy in our own personal everyday life? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, that's a wonderful point. Um, another piece of that that maybe I'll tie in is this idea around um, of helpless, helplessness around mm -hmm. environmental issues mm -hmm. and how there's this um, really important emotional component that's perhaps uh, not well addressed in our current uh, communication strategies around environmental issues. Mm -hmm. um, so you see, you know, newspaper articles uh, do a pretty good, well, many of them do a good job of um, conveying the scientific information, sharing the facts. Um, at the same time, it might not, they might not be recognizing some of the despair that folks feel or the sadness or the, um, the sense of being really overwhelmed. Um, so I think that's a space where art is, can be very effective in stepping in um, from a variety of angles of perhaps you know, acknowledging uh, some of those feelings and, and starting from that angle. Um, and on the other side, um, bringing more joy to those kind of spaces or packaging some of the issues in a way that they feel like more approachable, um, that there is this, this thread of happiness, even if the, the core material is, is more difficult. Um, there's some great work in this area as well on, in um, environmental psychology. So Renee Lertzman has a wonderful book on, um, I believe it's called Environmental Melancholia. And it's just showing how in many cases, especially when it comes to local environmental issues, pe people feel like really sad and really helpless and really burdened by them. And they need to, to break through that before they can move to action. Yeah, no, I, I like the idea of getting really practical 
even even in the way that our everyday emotions work like you know Andy Goldsworthy is is somebody that I that I've always paid attention to he's actually we have an artist of inspiration every quarter at the Della Plain he's our artist of inspiration um and you know Andy Goldsworthy isn't necessarily dealing directly with big environmental problems but he's at least it, the there's I, I'm not sure exactly how to say it. There's a tangibility to his work, seeing everyday objects um, used in particular ways uh, and, and nature used in these different ways that it, it's such a good inroad into the inquiry. Um, one, there's this quote that I really love by James Baldwin. And he said, the, the purpose of art is to reveal the questions hidden by the answers. Mm -hmm. um and i love that idea it, you know several times throughout your talk you were saying that you know a lot of the propositions that these art projects were bringing forth weren't necessarily coming up with solutions and i think we have i think we can have a bit of an addiction to answer sometimes and we don't allow the inquiry to be a, a, a real driving force and it seems to me that art and science in a lot of ways have have this um have this same drive towards inquiry that seems really important. Um, yeah, is it is it hard to for for you in this field? Does it seem hard to break away from the necessity of finding answers to these problems? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think definitely. Um, being able to approach it from this artistic angle is really helpful in that. Um, at the same time, you know, I publish my work in a variety of spaces from more like artistic or design spaces, but also in like information visualization or computer science spaces. And it's so interesting to me how um, those play out differently. So there is mm. a lot of uh, concern around um, perhaps proof of impact or proof around of, um, kind of more narrow and immediate achievements um, mm -hmm. in some of those spaces where other spaces are, are more comfortable with the vague questions and the um, sort of first guesses that are gonna take five or 10 years to play out. And I think that's one of the things that is really um, interesting and challenging about environmental art is often it's you know not acting on a three months time scale, it's acting on like a 10 years time scale. Wow. Yeah. Which can be hard when you have pressing issues like environmental issues where like maybe 10 years is too long. <laughs> um, yeah. So you know there's no no easy solution there, but I think it's just important to recognize how different fields approach questions and answers differently um, and what each of those perspectives can can bring to the table. Yeah. Um, I'll also circle back a little bit to Andy Goldsworthy since you mentioned yeah, um, yeah. his work. I showed um, just one of his pieces early on, but I talk about his work a little bit more in the paper. Um, and I think what's really powerful there is first this aspect of sort of surprise or joy or seeing spaces really differently um, as you encounter these natural objects in a natural environment, but looking so different from, from what you might expect. Yeah. Um, so that's a, just an opportunity to um, connect with spaces in a new way that can be really powerful. Mm -hmm. um, also there, I think um, those projects are um, often considered quite strong in terms of sort of secondary costs. costs. So, mm -hmm. you know, obviously has travel costs, which has financial and environmental uh, repercussions, but at the same time, the use of all natural materials, all local materials, um, is is uh, really innovative and come and is very beautiful and is very environmentally sound as well. So I think that's just a great thing to note about his work. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that's really interesting to me is the so. You know, one of the more daunting things about environmental problems is is be, is maybe that in focusing on your own on your own personal life mm -hmm. that the you're seeing something that's created by large groups of people and you're one person but i love how like your your um 
your art book project and these other things tie in this community aspect. And so there's, there's this simultaneous like interest in, in the art happening, but also um, the collaborative effort of the community seems to, I, I don't know it, at least for me, it, it brings to light the fact that um, we, if, if we're willing to take small steps, we're not just individuals facing big problems, but we really can come at it at a, as a community. And I love how the, the artwork itself draws people together in that way. That's super interesting to me. Yeah, that's all, those are all um, really great points. I'm glad you surfaced them because that's something I really have uh, paid attention to in my work recently mm -hmm. is how we can move from having people think about um, environmental issues as this hyper individual thing. So, you know, it's about whether you recycle, it's about like what you buy in the store. Um, can we step away from that um, as the only model and also realize that there's, there's things that we can do more on a community mm -hmm. level, on a national level, on an international level. And, and and that those things are really centrally important um, that perhaps we need to rethink the ratio of how much time we're spending on these like individual things versus um, the collective issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that again ties back to all these, these questions of like power and power and systems. Yeah. That's perhaps like difficult to take on even as a community, but mm -hmm. um, what I try and do in my work is at least get some of those first steps in there and that community building that can hopefully, you know, with a lot of other work, lead yeah. to some um, some larger impacts. Hmm. Yeah. Um, kind of along those lines, I'm wondering if you have any advice about, you know, um, I guess it's easy. Uh, like I'm a painter, but I also do some sculptural stuff and things. But in the painting process, you're constantly thinking about your work in the gallery setting, and so you so you're considering it within a very strict value system, like what, what you're making. And it can be really challenging if that's the only type of work that you're doing to, to break out of that way of thinking. Um, maybe maybe people even viewing this will, will have an inclination or desire to move into the realm of exploration into these places. Do you have any, do you have any suggestions about how to sort of break out of that mentality? Um, is it a matter of just being made aware of environmental artwork or what, do you have any thoughts in that direction? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think for sure, just taking taking time to the, explore the space um, mm. can be really valuable. Um, I think in my own experience, I've been very lucky to uh, go through a lot of really interdisciplinary programs um, which has provided a great opportunity to collaborate with folks who are in, you know, coming from a totally different perspective on these issues and in their practice. Um, so for me, having some sort of low stakes collaborations with folks who have a different perspective have been really helpful in um, starting to open up my perspective on what's possible and what approaches are valuable. Um, you know, what, whether it's theoretical or in terms of like different media used or, or anything else. Um, so I would also suggest that as a way to, to start exploring and start opening up and start seeing what else is out there. Um, yeah. I know some people, um, and this is less of perhaps an arts or design thing, but like, I think in the tech world, hackathons are a model in that space where you're bringing people together with a lot of different perspectives. And, you know, it's a short-term chance to experiment and to learn something. Um, also, many flaws with hackathons, but perhaps there's like a piece of that model that, that could be interesting in the artistic space um, yeah. to help people just see what else is out there and start to expand their own practices. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. Well, I don't see any other questions that have come through. I wanted to take a second to just ask you if you have any are there any projects coming up or any ideas that you have that you're really excited about? Anything you're working towards? Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that um, sometime soon, <laughs> our post-pandemic times, 
Um, I'll actually be holding a few more art boat installations um, in, in different locations around uh, the Northeast. Uh, so I'm really excited just to, to get those out there again um, and to work with different communities because it really is, it's so different uh, in each location and each water body with each group of people. Um, so that's a really exciting, exciting process to me. Um, yeah, I think that's the main thing I have, have coming up. Um, I've also been doing some work again around uh, water quality, uh, particularly in Maine and thinking about how um, both data visualization, but also collaborating um, with another faculty member at Northeastern who looks at games. Um, so trying to combine those ideas um, to see how that can be a powerful um, approach to bringing awareness and also action and also this uh, really strong um, aesthetic components into environmental issues to engage again different communities and help people see these issues in a different sort of way. Mm. Um, so I'm hopeful and excited to start up that work as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah, very cool. Well, Dr. Mirovich, thank you so much for your time today. Um, everything is so fascinating. I'm, I'm excited to go back and, and look at this and explore some new ideas. So thank you so much. Thank you too. It's been wonderful. Thank you for being a part of things. If you enjoy our programs, exhibitions, and classes and workshops, consider supporting us by becoming a member. Uh, members get a lot of great benefits at the Della Plain, including discounts on classes and workshops. You can find out more information about that on our website. And while you're on the channel, check out our other videos and don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to get notifications about other videos at the Bella Plain. Thank you all so much for being here. And again, thank you, Dr. Perovich, so much.